Welcome to Wine Soundtrack South Africa. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world. In 30 Answers, discover their stories, personalities and passions. Hello friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Morena Kalo and today I'm sitting with Irene de Florio from La Brie. Uh, Irene, a very warm welcome. Can you tell me a little bit more about yourself? Hi there, my name is Irene, as you heard, de Florio, even though I'm not French. Uh, I have married into a Mauritian French family and desperately trying to learn the language, which I think fits so perfectly with what I do. I make wine, it has a French heritage. I live in Franchuk, I work in Franchuk, we have the French heritage. Um, and who am I? I'm a person who's just passionate about wine, fell in love with it at a later stage of life, and this is it. This is where I'm ending off, where I think I'll always be an absolute wine lover. Tell me about La Brie. Where you mentioned French Hook, where in French Hook, and uh, tell me a bit more about uh, the brand itself. So La Brie is steeped in history. We were established in 1694 as a portion of land that was given to one of the original French Huguenots. And over the years, obviously, we've changed ownership and have recently been purchased again by a family. So always been privately owned, which is wonderful. And we pride ourselves on that because we are an estate and we have a lovely buzzword. We say signature styled wines created with passion. And I think that's what we're trying to instill here is, is wines that are quirky. They're a little bit different. They're not the run of the mill. Um, Don't expect to taste the same thing year on year. Really expect to taste the passion that we put into not only making the wine, but selling the wine to you at the same time. Mm. And I must admit, um, I've I've not made any secret of it that I'm a huge fan of of your wines. um, Because not only can, can you really taste the passion in your wines, but... I just love, there's an absolute feminine touch to your wines that just appeals to me in such a big way. It's incredible. Um, so so it is, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here with you today. So a little bit more about the farm. How many hectares of land is under vine? So the entire farm itself is only 23.7 hectares. We're small and currently 13 and a half hectares planted, but very excitingly, a new two hectare block uh, of Cabernet Sauvignon, which I think works beautifully in Franchuk, is going to be planted. We're trying to stick to a unique identity of what works well in our little part of the Franchuk Valley, because Franchuk might think of it as small, but in fact, the wine growing area stretches quite a bit. And between where you enter what is demarcated as Franchuk and where you end up with us in this little boar hook, your terroir varies dramatically. So what we've tried to do at Labrie is focus and say, right, on our terroir, our soil, this is what works best, and that is what is planted. Uh, new planters of Chardonnay specifically and Cabernet, which I think are, are the stars of what we make at Labrie. Mm. You, you really do good sh- uh, Chardonnay. And uh, my favorite, or two of my favorites, I recently attended a trade tasting. Um, my favorite is the Syrah, but uh, you recently also launched a Petit Bordeaux that got me very excited. So uh, tell me uh, a little bit more about um, the, the rest of your uh, range of wines. So while we want to have a call, and I think the core is the fact that we planted 95% to red at Libri, you need a core focus of those that do really well. But you know, I think as a winemaker, you always need to play and experiment and and otherwise you get stale, you get that cellar palette and you get a little bit bored. And we have these quirky little blocks and you've mentioned the Petit Verdot. It's actually our largest planting at Libri, strangely enough. And in 2015, we discovered that this wine was more than just the blending component. It was a wine that made people smile. And we've since then been bottling it since 2015 as a a single varietal uh, Petit Verdot. And then of course, while I think and I say our flagships here are Cabernet and our Chardonnay you have to have your own passion and my passion is Syrah and our Syrah is not straightforward again you know typical Labrie there's a quirk and a difference so it's actually a co-fermentation with two to three percent depending on the year of the on year which then again makes it stand out as something very unique to what we do here at Labrie itself. And then you forgot to mention another firm favorite, something that sparkles. Tell me a bit more about that. I'm very lucky in that my winemaking career started off 
um, learning how to make South African Cup Classic. And one of my favorite things to do every year is to go over to Champagne to see how we can do things better. And as a result, we've introduced since 2011 was our very first vintage of something we call Sauvage Labrie. Sauvage playing on the word Sabrage, but also that it's wild. It's the Franchuk flower. It's a celebration. And it's a celebration of an old vineyard planted in 1991, which is 100% Chardonnay. We make a very small amount, so every bottle you get will be hand numbered. And then to make it even more special, it spends a minimum of five. The current vintage is actually six years on leaves before we do gauge. And then just to top it off, there's zero dosage. So really, we're trying to get you to taste the purity of that old 1991 Chardonnay planting the whole way through, through that lifetime. And I would say it's, it's a bubbly that's got a, an easy 10, 15 year lifespan. We, we're still drinking the 2011 and it's superb. It is superb. I can qualify that for sure. Tell me, uh, Irene, where are your markets outside of South Africa? So we're lucky. We have formed really good relationships and I think our markets are about relationships. Uh, because we produce such a small amount at Libri, we are a boutique wine estate, that we have f formed relationships in the UK, specifically with a group called Portal Dingwall and Norris, who we've been supplying for the last 15 years, who look after us there. They're based um, south of London. And in, in Europe, we have a central point in Germany with Van Africa who import the wines and then distribute them from there. We obviously all have small markets, so if you go to Belgium, you will find um, an importer there. If you go to Switzerland, we have cup wine there. And in fact, just started, we have sent over, at the end of last year, our first shipment to the US, to North Carolina with Elephant Corner, and uh, we're so excited with, with where that future project is going to go. Mm, onwards and upwards and new frontiers for sure. You are a very passionate woman and, and it's one of the things that really stand out for me about you. Uh, where did this passion for wine begin? Was there like a seminal moment where you kind of thought, hmm, this is interesting stuff. I want to learn more about it. I think about that often because I started in a strange way. I actually trained it as an accountant first then realized that wasn't really me. So I love to talk, as you can hear, and I love to teach people. So I actually taught maths and accounting for a number of years. And I did a Cape Wine Academy course. And there was one lecturer there who just blew my wine mind away. And, and um, I realized that actually this is what I want to do. And at the age of 37, 38, quit my job, uh, climbed on a plane and went to Australia, and uh, then traveled the world for nine years seven or nine years, getting experience in France, coming back to South Africa, teaching in the UK to pay for it all, until I decided in 2001 to go back and actually study wine. So it, it, it was a combination of a simple wine course that I did, I uh, happened to have a boyfriend whose father was passionate about wine, and then just realized that th this is something I have an absolute, it took me a while to decide what to do with it, whether to write about it make it or just drink it and then finally realize now I, I want to make it so that I can enjoy it and other people can enjoy it as well. What an incredible story. It's really fantastic. So you've traveled obviously extensively around the world. Uh, were there along the way any outstanding wines that you really remember very fondly um, or, or maybe uh, wines that are outstanding in the opposite sense that you're desperately trying to forget ever drinking them. That, yeah, just something that really stands out for you um, that you came across along the way. I think I have to mention, because it ties in with my passion, one of the very first wines, and I remember it distinctly, was a Perrier Jouer Belle Poc, the 1990 vintage. And that is still, if I talk about a wine, that sounds uh, monumental to me. And then got to Australia, and discovered a tiny producer by the name of Drew Noon, who was making all of his wine out of a swimming, tool, a swimming pool fermentation, you know those round plastic swimming pools, mm -hmm. with a hundred year old Shiraz vines. So that started the passion for Shiraz. Then of course went off to France and ended up in the Northern Rhone um, in a little place called Vienne and was exposed to the concept of co-fermentation of Shiraz and Viognier together, which ignited 
that passion and then very fortunately had friends who had a little place in Burgundy and managed to stay there with them just outside of Bone and got the passion for, for Shiraz. So I think each of my little things has come from an opportunity where I was able to work and able to experience and, and develop a passion for those uh, particular wines. Mm. Yeah, it's isn't it wonderful to be able to travel in the way that we can today uh, and, and experience and learn and and just kind of taste our way around the world because everywhere we go has its own unique nuances and and styles which yeah it's a it's a real pleasure and a an honor to be able to do that um i know you can't ask a winemaker which of their children is their favorite but if you have to think of your 2023 vintage and the 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 wines that are currently in your cellar sleeping either in in wooden barrels or in, in, in concrete eggs or, or what, wherever they are, which of those is, gets you a little bit excited at the moment? I think I have to say because it's more, it's this grape has supported me the whole way through. So we've had some difficult years at Liberty where we actually did not make wine. So I didn't bottle most of the 2018 and 2019 reds. Uh, 2014 was a disaster, 2010, because we rely on our own grapes, we're very much vintage specific. But there's one variety that just always stands by, and that's my Syrah. And I don't know if it's because it has that Viognier to help it along, but even now, this vintage, oh, we struggled with the rain at the wrong time, and I mean, enormous amounts of rain, so it was a really difficult vintage. And yet still, the second pick of the Syrah comes through, we tasted all of the 23 wines the other day, and I'm just blown away with what that vineyard block can do on sandy soils every year for us and so it's uh, it's a thank you to the syrup always standing by and and presenting something that's beautiful knowing that you can just always rely on it it's good good, good to have that backup for sure um, what is your opinion on wine critics wine scoring competitions that kind of thing I love wine competitions, but you've got to develop a very thick skin as a winemaker and not take offense when someone doesn't like your wine. Um, I learned that quite quickly after a few kicks under the table from my husband, that just accept everyone has a different opinion, and thankfully they do, because otherwise we wouldn't all be able to sell wine. So my general approach is learn which competitions have tasters that you know will appreciate your style of wine. Enter the wine. If you win, you tell everybody about it. If you don't, well, then you just keep quiet on the side. But they, they for us especially, we have one or two of the range that are on a shelf that you can buy commercially. And in South Africa especially, that little bling on the bottle makes a difference. Uh, we find for the European market is not so much because very much our wine is a hand sell over there and, and our um, the team that are presenting the wine for us know the quality of the wine. But they, they still is very much choose your your competition and your your critic correctly as to someone that you know understands what you're trying to achieve and then you will get the result that you want from that either competition or person so con consumers visiting the farm um, we here in South Africa have an amazing wine tourism experience um, if you come as a consumer, as a guest to La Brie, I know you do some exciting wine pairings with some, some fun stuff. Um, but when it comes to you personally pairing food and wine, what is your your kind of recipe? Is there a recipe? Is it a, you know, whatever works for you? How do you take uh, take that one on? I think I'm very fortunate from the moment I arrived at La Brie. I've always sort of had carte blanche to make and bottle what I want and I say I but in fact I have an amazing team so I'm kind of the head winemaker but I have an incredible winemaker with me Glenn Isaacs he's been at Libri actually a year longer than me he's my right hand and both of us have an approach where we make wine first of all that we like to drink and that's what goes in the bottle but most importantly we both love our food so every bottle of wine 
somewhere along the way, in the back of our minds, we know that that's what we want home, take home to eat or drink with that food. So I would say very much yes. Labrie wines you can just drink and enjoy, but ultimately they are all definitely food wines. If I, I, I can pick out one in particular, we do a very quirky under our double door range, which is the quirky range, 100% Roussan. And that double door range somehow always seems to be wines like the Roussan, which has texture on the palate, which is even more than the rest, is crying out for a food combination. Um, and I wish we had more of it in South Africa, scallops. And I think scallops in creamy sauce and that Roussan is just a, a wonderful combination. That sounds amazing. Um, and then uh, what would you say a non-wine drinker loses out uh, by not enjoying wine look i'm very much of the opinion wine isn't just about drinking so i will go out and if there isn't wine that i like i'll just drink water i've never been one to drink for the sake of drinking and i think when you drink wine that is one of the special things about when you get to a level where you're really appreciating wine as what it is as a creative product rather than just something to drink then you're missing out on the nuances. You're missing out, for example, with my syrup. The longer you leave it in the glass, every time we come back to it, there's a completely new aroma profile that pops out of the glass. And if, if you don't want to drink that, you, you're missing out on that experience of the creativeness and this magic that this grape can produce so many different flavor profiles and such textures on the palate. Um, it's definitely for me never about an alcoholic drink. It's about a creation of something beautiful to be enjoyed. It's art. That's what it comes down to. Wine is art, for me anyway. <laughs> okay, so space aliens land in their UFO on that patch of grass in front of the manor house. And they've traveled a long way, so they're thirsty. What would you pour for them to drink? Today's a winter day, so I think we need to split. If they come in summer, absolutely the Libri Chardonnay, because that is just a third quencher. It's, it's a sit outside in the sun, enjoy the yellow of the label, the brightness, the sunshine, offer all the best of the South African weather and climate that you've got to offer. And I think the, the Chardonnay epitomizes that in the glass. But today's a nice summer winter's day we've got a fire roaring here so i think at the moment one of the wines i think is drinking best at Labrie is our Labrie bordeaux style blend which is the Labrie affinity it's a 2020 vintage and it's just got onto that three years now um where it's starting to mellow and there's a beautiful welcoming roundness to it that's going to say to anyone who comes to Labrie, including the aliens welcome home Welcome home, indeed. I'd like to chat a little bit um, about your 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 branding, your labels, um, because I absolutely love the story uh, around the thinking there. Could you maybe share that? So, all of our flowers on the labels are flowers that are endemic to the Western Cape. So when you identify a bottle of Labrie, first thing you'll notice is a capsule. And the capsule color is actually the capsule color, is the color of the flower itself. And then each flower has been chosen because it tells a story about the wine. So for example, on our Chardonnay, we have Clivia Miniata, and the flower is the buttercup. And it's talking about that Chardonnay, bright, sunshine, yellow, everything that you expect to find in a beautiful bottle of Le Brie Chardonnay. So next time you do buy, have a look out for our label, the capsule, and the story. It's written on the bottle and the name of the flower, the story behind the wine. I just absolutely love that. So some people read tea leaves in the bottom of a cup to predict the future. If you could predict the future for Le Brie, by reading the leftover sediment in a red wine glass. What would those sediment particles tell, uh, tell us about the future for Labrie? I think you and we at Labrie are always aiming 
to be better. You know, as winemakers, we get one chance a year, <laughs> not like a, a other producers. So I think every year you you keep trying to do better and better and produce the ultimate wine um, that you would like to drink and you think that others would like to drink. So I think in the pipeline we have that. We, we, we would like... I think our wines are, are good. I think we make them well at the moment. You always want to make that little top one. And I think that's definitely something we want to look at. And then not just on the wine side of things, an exciting development in the near future is um, an expanded area for our tasting room where I think we have one of the best views in Franschhoek from our patio. And my biggest issue has always been it's too small can't get enough people there and we are expanding the size of it so i can't wait to introduce that in the future to our customers coming to Liberty. Mm, that is very exciting there's a lot of excitement happening on the farm which is wonderful so uh that it will be nice to have the patio uh, a little bit bigger for sure when you're not working what do you do how do you spend your free time other than drinking wine, of course, um, and, in, and, and most importantly, trying other people's wines. I uh, try not to drink too much of my own. Again, that cellar palate concept. I love to travel. Uh, my husband does as well, and we love Europe. Uh, interestingly enough, all our ho- overseas holidays tend to go where the wine areas are, of course. But in, in my free time at home, I love to run. Well, my, my jogging running version of it, that's, that's my time to think and my space and read. I read a lot. I've always had an absolute passion for it. Um, so it's, yeah, spending time with friends, enjoying wine, running, drinking, reading. <laughs> Favorite books? <laughs> that's a fun one. It's actually mystery books. And there's a, a writer who is focused a series based in Europe and, and it, part of the plot has always got to do with wine. <laughs> so I absolutely <laughs> love those side of things. <laughs> who, who's, who's this author? Peter May. Peter. Yeah. There you go. Um, movies? Any movies that you particularly enjoy? If you had to say, oh my word, that's one of my all-time favorites. I have to laugh. We were trying to remember when last we were actually at a, a cinema. I don't, I don't think we go. So we actually, I watch very little television. We, we never switch it on. Very few movies. Um, and I actually don't think I can put a finger on anything that I've seen or, or could actually mention in the, in the last. Oh, I did see a rerun or the, the latest one of Top Gun. Oh. I was a Top Gun fan. <laughs> you have no idea how often that movie comes up in this interview. It's quite interesting. Um, for a really romantic evening, you and your husband go out for dinner. What are you most likely to order wine-wise off the menu? Red. Um, some form of red, but I have a difficult one here. We, because we're both in the wine industry, we tend to take our own wine with us. <laughs> so when you ask me what would I order, it, it would usually be if there is one of my wines in the winery, I would do that to support the establishment that we've gone to. But otherwise, we, we often tend to, to take our own. And and we have a little aside as well. I, um, I've been allowed to make a little bit of wine, which I've done for my husband. Um, it's what he likes to drink so uh, he has a Chardonnay Mm -hmm. um, which we put under a a brand called Marcology after his name and that that always seems to find its way into the bag on the way to a restaurant. I like that I think my husband would love to have a (laughs) wine just for him he'd love that. Um, uh, What would you say was the best piece of advice you've ever received or been given that that you feel you would pass on to maybe a younger Irene? Um, It's always been a a thing I've got, I think I've got from my father, more than just a piece added on. I don't think he, he, don't think he passed it on to me, he just did it by who he was, is that you do unto others as you you want them to do unto you. He was uh, a larger than life person who, he was a teacher, a headmaster, where children would come to him before they go to the parents because he was that kind of empathetic, listening, um, caring about everyone. Um, And I would like that to always say that hopefully people have have an approach where they're prepared to come and know that I have an open door and they'll come and sit um, and chat to me if there are issues and and they need things sorted. What would you say is your proudest achievement in your career? That's a difficult one. Um, 
two parts. Firstly, on the wine part, my five-star platter, 95 decanter, um, just because it was something I always wanted to get. And we got that for our Cabernet Sauvignon, and it was just such a celebratory moment. Um, and then I have to say the other part was um, finally at a, a ripe old age deciding to get married. So I got married on my 50th birthday <laughs> just a month before. And that definitely was a defining moment in, in my life. It's taking that long, but when I decided there was the right time, it's, it's one of the things like winemaking is for life. This is now for life. <laughs> very, very cool. If you could have uh, or share a bottle or two of wine with anyone dead or alive who would it be and what would the wine be that one is a difficult one again um, I suppose I'd, it's strange how you go back to that I'd go back to my father again because while he wasn't a drinker he loved red wine and he loved good red wine um, and to be able to because unfortunately he passed away before I qualified so he never got to see what I produced so I think that would be a real thing for me to take most probably would be my Syrah and sit down with him and say look dad look that would be awesome that would be special do you think us humans will still be drinking wine in 2000 years time and, and, and what do you think if so what do you think those wines will look like Definitely. Look how long it's been around already. If it survived all the years to get here from Persia. <laughs> I, in fact, some people say all the way back to Noah. Um, I uh, definitely see it in the future. And interestingly enough, I don't see too much of a change in terms of what it is and how it's made. Because I think the classic will still endure. The quirky will come and go. I do, however, see a trend towards a more... Um, accessible style at the moment just because of people's lifestyles they want to be able to enjoy now they don't have the time or the space to store things for 10 to 15 years so I think in that way we might see an evolution um, but hopefully it will be far more just as a as an appreciation um, that wine becomes more and more that as opposed to just uh, a guzzle and dop <laughs> I hear you your aliens have had a fabulous time and they have to go back but they've got strict instructions to come back with a human they've chosen you and they've asked you to bring back some of this amazing liquid that you make um, which three bottles any bottles from anywhere in the world including your own which three bottles would you take with to the planet wherever it may be I think I would definitely take a bottle of my 2015 Cabernet Sauvignon I just think it's a beautiful example of what purity and classic and elegance is in French and what we can do with Cabernet Sauvignon I possibly would take back a Courton Charlemagne if I could because hopefully then they'd let my husband come with me as well and he'd be drinking that <laughs> And on the third, a bottle of bubbles. And if I could get hold of that peri rare again, I'd take that with me. <laughs> oh, take me with you in that case, for sure. Okay, is there, are there any winemaking areas anywhere in the world that you still really would like to explore? I know you said you generally when you go on holiday, that's, there's always that element to it. But where would you still like to go that you haven't been yet? I think there's some fun and interesting things happening. So, for example, we, we talked about going to Greece a while ago. I'm not sure if it's there, but they, they, they work a lot with them for and, and something I want to start playing with a little bit at Libris. I thought that would be quite an interesting way to look and see what they're making. It might not have an effect on our wine making, but it surely would be an interest factor. And they definitely need to go back to Italy. I spent a very small amount of time there right at the beginning when I just got introduced to wine. And I'd love to go back that now and spend a lot more time in Tuscany um, play with that and um, and see if there is something there we can bring back to Libri. Fair enough, very nice we're almost done, before we finish off though I'd like to play a little game so I am going to give you three varieties or styles of wine and I would like you to pair that with either a song 
or a music artist or a genre or something that you feel really represents this wine. So I'd like to start with Cup Classique. Stay away to heaven. <laughs> I love that. That was so quick. <laughs> that, was, that was an easy one. <laughs> that's what it is. If you make it in its purest form, that's what it is. It's, uh, yeah, shout to the stars. They did talk about the stars. I'm seeing the stars. Well, for me, it's my stay away to heaven. Yeah, and you can almost hear the angels singing down to you. Right. And um, the next one is Sarah. It's going to be, I think it's something, the song called, we're going to have a good time tonight. <laughs> And I think that's what our Syrah does. It's around the fire wine. It was our wedding wine in the same venue. And we danced a lot that night. Uh, so I think, yeah, for my Syrah, definitely, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a good time tonight. Very good. And lastly, Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, I was going to say Lady in Red, but that's wrong. Because it needs to be something a little bit more elegant, um, and classic in style, so perhaps actually maybe something like a Vivaldi Four Seasons um, for the elegance and the, the classicness of what I see as the purity of Cabernet Sauvignon. Awesome. Awesome. Love it. Irene, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, would you like to remind our listeners where they can find Labrie online, on social media, and what they can expect um, if they were to visit the farm here in Franschhoek? So first of course, foremost, your, your best bet is to come to Libri. We have an amazing tasting room, an incredible staff. They're born and bred from Shook. They've been with me for years and you will not forget the experience you have at Libri. We're easy. We're 400 meters from the monument, one and a half kilometers from the center of town. You can come by tram, by car, by tuk-tuk, or you can even walk if you want to. But if you can't get down to Franschhoek, then please pop out, um, go into a select number of fine wine stores. You might find some Libri there. Otherwise, you can always come online to um, www.labrie.coza and then follow us, please, on Instagram at Labrie Wine and our Facebook page as well, Labrie Wine. Super duper. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack South Africa. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.